<laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about, we'll have lab later. You can just sit down. Uh, we're going to talk about one genus of the Wallace bacteria called Mycoplasma. The one species we're going to talk about, Pneumoniae. Guess what it causes? Yep, that's nice how it works. These are the smallest free living bacteria. They are smaller than a micrometer. They do not have any peptidoglycan. What they're going to have to give them stability, they'll have an extra cell membrane, and then they'll have extra sterols uh, that are going to give them some support. The thing about that, though, because they don't have a cell wall, they don't really exist out in the environment, so they're going to be transmitted through uh, respiratory droplets, but you have to be, you know, kind of close to the person. So you're not going to pick it up off of fomites because it won't last very long on the environment or on a surface. Because they don't have a peptidoglycan cell wall, then antibiotics for that target peptidoglycan, target the cell wall, will be ineffective. So penicillins, beta-lactam, cephalosporins, they're not going to work. Because they don't have that peptidoglycan cell wall, oh, I'm not even on. Because they don't have their peptidoglycan cell wall, they're going to be pleomorphic, so they won't have a very rigid shape. They do have a characteristic uh, colonies when they grow on agar, so they kind of look like fried eggs. You can kind of tell them that way. Like I said they can't live for long periods of time, so uh, you're going to contract this type of pneumonia, which is called walking pneumonia. We'll talk about why it's called walking pneumonia in just a minute. Uh, but you have to be respiratory droplets, usually places, they're going to, uh, in crowds, uh, so a lot of people in a close area, and so we're going to kind of go through that. So pneumonia is a lower respiratory infection, and we know that all microorganisms, they have to stick first, so they have a special adhesin proteins, and they can stick to ciliated epithelium, so respiratory epithelium, and just, just a cool picture, so do that in there. So they stick, then they have some toxic proteins, including hydrogen peroxide, which is a reactive oxygen species, so they can damage the epithelium, the cilia, and the cilia are there normally in the airways, they row up and things get trapped in the mucus, then you swallow it, and that keeps things from getting to the lungs. Because they're damaging the cilia, they can get to the lungs, and they create they create a super antigen, and so that brings about the systemic responses. So usually it's headache, low-grade fever, just sort of feeling crappy. It's atypical or walking for a couple reasons. Uh, one, it's very slow to develop, so it just starts off, somebody has a cold, you know, they've got that little snot in the back of the throat, so maybe a sore throat, and then they develop a cough, but it's a cough that won't really go away or is lingering for weeks. It's called walking pneumonia because you don't feel great, but you're not really sick enough to stay home, you know, like maybe just like a little low, like every now and then a little low grade fever at the end of the day, you go to bed, you wake up like, all right, you know, I feel okay. So people walk around and then they spread it to, to other people. And the other thing that's unique about this type of pneumonia, usually with pneumonia, you, you have a fever and then you have sputum, you have a productive wet cough. And in this case, the cough, you have a lot of coughing, but it's dry coughing. So you don't get that fluid in the alveoli. Instead, the damage is going to be ex outside of the air sac, so the lung tissue. So you just don't get that fluid infiltration into the alveoli. Usually it's self-limiting, but many times people can't clear it, so they go to the doctor, and then it has to be properly diagnosed because you have to get the right antibiotic. Um, and like I said, it can't be an antibiotic that targets cell walls because they don't have one. And I think it was one of our clinical focus, I think it's clinical focus in chapter three or something, gives the whole story about how they were misdiagnosed and given the wrong antibiotic. So we've talked about two causative agents of pneumonia. And like I said, pneumonia, you've got a lot of coughing, it's lower respiratory, so that they all have in common. Streptococcus pneumoniae, also called pneumococcus, like I said, that's our number one community acquired pneumonia. You're gonna worry about your older people and so there is a vaccine recommended for people over the age of 50 to uh, protect against streptococcus pneumoniae. Usually with this too, it's a productive cough and often has rust-colored sputum. Mycoplasma pneumoniae, they are the Wallace bacteria. You have to be in close contact, so close contact respiratory droplets. More often you see this in the crowded young. 
So on campuses and school classrooms, military barracks, and like I said, they call it walking pneumonia. You have a dry cough, you feel bad, but like I said, not bad enough to where you know you're gonna stay home and go to the doctor. And then 30% of pneumonias are caused by viral, they're usually milder, and we'll hit Klebsiella pneumonia next week. The next topic are the spirochetes, and those are these flexible corkscrew shaped bacteria. We're going to talk about two. Treponema pallidum is the causative agent of syphilis, because who doesn't want to talk about syphilis in the morning? And then Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease. Remember, they have that endoflagella, so interior, and so they have movement. They can move like a corkscrew, and they can burrow and penetrate in tissues. You can't see them with a gram stain. They're technically gram negative, but they're so thin, you have to use either dark field or fluorescent microscopy to see them, and that's why I told you in lab, we'll, we'll never see one. The disease manifestations are due to mostly our immune response, so that collateral damage even though these two pathogens are completely different evolutionarily, so all they have in common, they're both spirochetes, strangely enough, they, each disease has three stages to it. So they have that in common. And they involve rashes. So that's for you. All right, so let's talk about syphilis first. Syphilis is a sexually transmitted infection caused by the bacterium Treponema pallidum. Dr. Stacey Rizza, an infectious diseases specialist at Mayo Clinic, says syphilis affects men and women and can present in various stages. Primary syphilis causes an ulcer, and this sometimes isn't noticed because it's painless and can be inside the vagina or on the cervix. After a few weeks to months, they can get secondary syphilis, which is a rash. It may then progress to latent stage syphilis, and finally, the most serious stage, tertiary. Pregnant women are not immune to syphilis. Congenital syphilis can lead to miscarriage, stillbirth, or infant deaths. That's why all pregnant women should be screened. Syphilis is preventable and treatable. As for prevention, Dr. Rizza recommends barrier protection during sex. And that's during oral sex, anal sex, vaginal sex, using condoms, dental dams, and any other barrier protection. For the Mayo Clinic News Network, I'm Vivian Williams. Syphilis. <laughs> All right, so as far as pathogenesis, it sticks to the mucosal membrane. It makes hyaluronidase, which uh, helps tissue invasion. And like I said, they do have that corkscrew motility. When they get inside, they can prevent phagocytosis. One of the ways that they do that is they coat themselves in fibronectin. So fibronectin is part of our sugar coating, our extracellular matrix, and we use that it helps with signal transduction, so what's happening out of the cell being translated inside of the cell. And so they coat themselves in that so they're just not recognized. They can spread um, throughout the bloodstream, and like I said, it's our immune response that is going to bring about the disease manifestations. So primary syphilis, about three weeks after exposure, there is a what's called a hard shanker. It is a painless sore or ulcer, it, at this point it is highly infectious, but we just watched that video. Sometimes it's in a place that somebody doesn't notice, and if it's not causing you pain, like it can go unnoticed. Um, other things, so this and for Lyme disease, because it has the different stages, and you're gonna kind of see that some of these signs are very generic, like just achy or, or a fever or lymphadenopathy or something, um, both of these diseases can go undiagnosed but highly infectious from those sores, and that's like a swab looking out. You can see the spirochetes. Right about when the chancre is healing, then if there's the secondary syphilis occurs, and so it's just flu-like, just feeling bad, fever. What is unique are the rashes, so often you don't get rashes, and we're gonna look at some pictures in a minute. So secondary syphilis, it can be treatment. Someone's treated, they recover. Secondary syphilis, it will end, sometimes so it can take two years, uh, and then you have a latent period and then it can be hidden and asymptomatic after that. So people are infectious, primary syphilis, secondary syphilis. Um, once it's latent and tertiary, it is not uh, communicable. So let's talk rashes. 
Syphilis has quite a long history with the human population, and so think of these rashes and just think of some of the uh, fashions of the day, those long flowy sleeves that cover up your hands. Ah! <laughs> I was like, yeah, it covers up rashes. So uh, soles of the hands, palms of the feet are very unusual places to get rashes. You know, like a skin rash, you're like, oh, okay, you know, oh, I had a reaction to something. You can kind of see that. So look for that, yeah, handshakes. Very unlikely that you catch it with a handshake unless you have an open wound, but it is possible. Like I said, so someone is very infectious at that, at that point. On mucous membranes, it tends to show up as white patches, so on the tongue, um, also the genital area. Uh, so this is condyloma latum, this is a female, but it can also be around the anus. So rashes are involved. And then, like I said, then it can go latent. So it could be 10 years, 20 years, and progress to tertiary syphilis. And it's only some people, so left untreated. You get what are called gummas, so granulomatous lesions. And once again, it can spread throughout the body. So it just depends where these lesions will be. It can be on the skin. It could be uh, bone. And this is looking at the testes. It can spread to the brain, and you get mental illness, eyes, blindness, heart, blood vessels. Like I said, once and this is for all diseases, once they're spreading, it just depends on the patient where it's going to take root, I guess, and cause damage. But it is a, yeah, so a lot of famous people. Syphilis was big, it's really big across the world. So yeah, so primary, chancre, secondary, flu-like symptoms and the rashes, and then tertiary, so gummas and lesions, and systemic. Where it originated, they believe it originated in the Americas, and then Christopher Columbus and all the sailors took it back to Europe, and then it spread across the globe. Whether that's true, not really sure. We can't really trace it out. But the whole world has syphilis. How about that? We'll do that. A lot of syphilis is going on, including in the United States. We have our own little history with syphilis. And so early 1930s, about 1 in 10 adults would contract it, and they had a big movement to try to cure syphilis. And so this is pre-antibiotics, or right about the time where they were about to discover antibiotics. And when we talk about chemotherapeutic drugs, a lot of times they were looking, they were looking for a drug that would treat syphilis. They couldn't treat it. They were even giving people malaria that had syphilis because they could treat malaria with quinine. And the fevers of malaria often could cure someone of syphilis. So like I said, there was a big movement to figure out how do we deal with syphilis because a lot of people had syphilis. <laughs>
but these were soon replaced with placebos. Under the false pretense of providing a special remedy, researchers performed painful and invasive spinal taps to investigate the disease's neurological consequences. When patients died, the PHS would swoop in to study the body by funding funerals in exchange for autopsies. In their published studies, they listed the men as volunteers to obscure the circumstances under which they'd been recruited. Outside Alabama, syphilis treatment was advancing. A decade after the study began, clinical trials confirmed that penicillin effectively cured the disease in its early stages. But in Tuskegee, researchers were determined to keep pursuing what they considered vital research. They had yet to confirm their theories about racial difference, and they believed they would never have another opportunity to observe the long-term effects of untreated syphilis. The study's leadership decided to withhold knowledge of new treatments from their subjects. During World War II, researchers convinced the local draft board to exempt men from their study, preventing them from enlisting and potentially accessing penicillin. The study even continued through the 1950s when penicillin was shown to help manage late-stage syphilis. By today's bioethical standards, withholding treatment in a research study without a patient's informed consent is morally abhorrent. But for a large part of the 20th century, this practice was not uncommon. In the 1940s, U.S.-led studies in Guatemala infected numerous prisoners, sex workers, soldiers, and mental health patients with sexually transmitted infections to study potential treatments. And other studies throughout the 50s and 60s saw doctors secretly infecting patients with viral hepatitis and even cancer cells. Eventually, researchers began objecting to these unjust experiments. In the late 1960s, an STI contact tracer named Peter Buxton convinced the PHS to consider ending the study. But after leadership decided against it, Buxton sent his concerns to the press. In July of 1972, an expose of the Tuskegee study made headlines across the country. Following public outcry, a federal investigation, and a lawsuit, the study was finally shut down in 1972, 40 years after it began, and 30 after a treatment for syphilis had been found. No evidence of any racial difference was discovered. When the study ended, only 74 of the original 600 men were alive. 40 of their wives and 19 of their children had contracted syphilis, presumably from their husbands and fathers. In the wake of this tragedy and concerns about similar experiments, Congress passed new regulations for ethical research and informed consent. But systemic racism continues to permeate medical care and research throughout the U.S. To truly address these issues, the need for structural change, better access to care, and transparency in research remains urgent. Journalism has been used as a tool to expose corruption and injustice for centuries. Dig into the story of how one young journalist set out to uncover the truth about lynchings in the American South. All right, how many of you have heard of that before? All right, not everyone had, so I felt that was warranted. A lot of atrocities have been committed in the spirit of science, and this isn't something, you know, the U.S. wants to make sure people know, because it was like, oh, Hitler did a bunch of stuff. We, did, we didn't do any of that stuff. And just know your history, and it makes it very understandable the distrust that occurs between marginalized groups and the government, or science in general. And risk. So syphilis uh, is vertically transmitted. So from mother to child, and then it's called congenital syphilis. And it is on the rise, as is syphilis. And Texas is number one. We were not number one prior to the pandemic, but evidently the pandemic, we are now number one in congenital syphilis. And uh, can cause premature birth, of course, stillbirths, miscarriages. Um, and then after the baby is born, they are, they are infected, and one of the calling cards is what's called snuffles. It affects the, you get facial deformities, a lot of secretions, so they make a snuffling sound when they breathe. Uh, then when teeth come in, they will have notches, so that's Hutchinson's teeth. And mothers are supposed to be screened uh, when they come in for prenatal care. But the fact that it's on the rise and doubled, uh, yeah, yikes. 650% increase from 2016 to 2019. Um, yeah, 
So 80% of the cases, like I said, Texas is number one, of course, Houston, Dallas, of course, those are the cities, so that's not really surprising, but just that it's on the rise. And so they did a study going, why, like I said, in sexual contact, you get that, but it's not supposed to happen because it is Texas Health and Safety Code that's requiring saying that pregnant women are supposed to be screened um, first visit, then third trimester, and then at delivery, and they did a study and they're realizing two thirds of mothers were not screened, the ones that had the cases. So reviewing that, just trying to get the word out that that needs to occur to stop congenital syphilis. And you can Google it throughout history because if that many people had syphilis, so did a lot of their children. And like I said, it affects the bones and so they get gummas everywhere as well. So horrible pictures, you can Google it if you're interested. All right, um, our last one is Borrelia burgdorferi. And I'm gonna let Professor Dave, because I was looking for, you know, I was like to give you some sort of video. I don't like to talk that much yet, I noticed that. <laughs> but, um, and it has a life cycle to it, so it's just easier, he can move things that I can't. But he does a nice review of some other terminology and things we've studied. Professor Dave here, let's talk about Lyme disease. He knows all about the science of Professor Dave explains. You may have heard about Lyme disease on the news or on TV and wondered what it was about. Lyme disease is a bacterial infection acquired by the bite of an infected tick, which classifies Lyme disease as a vector-borne illness. As we mentioned in an earlier tutorial, this means that the infection is transmitted to humans by a mosquito, tick, or flea. The disease itself is a little complicated, presenting itself slightly differently depending on the person and the stage of disease. Generally speaking though, early Lyme disease symptoms include headache, chills, fever, fatigue, joint aches, and swollen lymph nodes. In addition, about 70 to 80% of infected people experience a bullseye-shaped skin rash called erythema migrans. If left untreated, Lyme disease can spread to the heart, joints, and the nervous system, causing symptoms like nerve pain, spinal cord inflammation, arthritis, facial palsy, severe headaches, and shooting pains in the tendons, joints, muscles, and bones. Because early symptoms are so similar to that of the flu or other diseases, Lyme disease can be difficult to diagnose and isn't always reported to state health departments. There's still a lot that we don't know about Lyme disease, especially in the case of long-term infections, but let's get a closer look and talk about what we do know. Lyme disease is an infection caused by a corkscrew-shaped bacterium, also called a spirochete, named Borrelia burgdorferi. There are at least 10 related species of Borrelia that can cause Lyme disease in animals and humans. Lyme disease was first studied in 1977, when a cluster of children with arthritis were found in Lyme, Connecticut. In 1982, Willie Burgdorfer linked the strange disease to the spirochete, and the medical community honored his discovery by naming it Borrelia burgdorferi. These bacteria are gram-negative and have multiple flagella that give them their characteristic twisting motility. Genetically speaking, these bacteria have a linear chromosome, which is quite unusual in the bacterial world, in addition to a large number of smaller DNA molecules, or plasmids. Interestingly, these bacteria don't have the usual virulence factors, which are the factors that many bacterial pathogens typically have to cause damage, such as toxins or lipopolysaccharide. Here's where it gets extra tricky, so pay close attention. B. burgdorferi infects a wide range of small mammals, birds, and lizards. Ticks, particularly black-legged ticks, transfer B. burgdorferi from these vertebrate animals to humans. This is the only documented way for humans to get infected by B. burgdorferi. Let's talk more about those ticks. In the U.S. in particular, the black-legged tick, also known as deer tick, or more formally, Ixodes scapularis, spreads the disease in the northeast, mid-Atlantic, and north-central regions of the U.S. The western black-legged tick, Ixodes pacificus, spreads the disease on the Pacific coast. Ticks can attach anywhere on the body, especially hard to see areas, 
Most commonly, it's the smaller, more immature versions of ticks called nymphs that infect humans because they're more difficult to see. It typically takes 36 to 48 hours of attachment for the Lyme disease bacterium to be transmitted. To diagnose Lyme disease, doctors test for certain antibodies that the body makes in response to infection. However, it can take several weeks or even longer for antibodies to develop, which can lead to a negative test result even if a patient has been bitten by an infected tick. To make things more complicated, antibodies can hang out in the body for months or years after the infection is gone. And if that's not enough, there are multiple other diseases, viruses, bacteria, and autoimmune conditions that can give a false positive result for Lyme disease. If all this gives you a headache, you're not alone. However, scientists are working tirelessly to learn more and develop newer, more accurate tests to diagnose Lyme disease. In the meantime, the best thing you can do is try to limit exposure to ticks and stay extra vigilant about checking for them after outdoor excursions. So after a hike in tall grass, you know what to do. Thanks for watching guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making company. All right, so Borrelia burgdorferi causes Lyme disease and it is our number one vector-borne disease, about 300,000 cases per year. Challenges, they have antigenic variation, so they change their surface protein, so it's hard to get immunity and effective antibodies against them. It's our immune response that does the damage, and it is often just misdiagnosed. There's not a great test for it. We're gonna go through the stages that bullseye rash is usually that first stage. Oh, what's wrong slide? Oh, there you go. It's a zoonosis, so it's transmitted from animals to humans. We are an accidental host. Here is the distribution. We do have Lyme disease in Texas, so about 50 to 250 human cases that are reported. I said the reservoir for it is the white-footed mouse or other rodents, and it's always a black-legged tick that is the vector. And they are very small. That's a better picture. So the head of a pin. So they are really small, so even if somebody goes out hiking and they look for it, they could miss it depending upon where they're being bitten. But it does have to attach and feed for at least 36 hours to transmit the disease. But it is not communicable, so when someone has Lyme disease, you know, you're not, you don't catch Lyme disease from somebody, it's only from the tick. And it could be either the nymph or the adult that is uh, the one that's transmitting it. Deers themselves, because they call it the deer tick, the deers actually don't get infected, strangely enough. But they do monitor the ticks. They do monitor their ticks and deer uh, in Texas. So they are monitoring Lyme disease. All right, so you think if you had a rash like this, I don't know, would you guys go to the doctor if you had that? Yeah. How big is it? <laughs> it looks pretty big. It looks pretty big, but I mean, have you ever just, what would you do? That might be think you might, uh, I just got bit by something? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It depends how busy I am, to be honest. If I was super busy, that no, no, I'm all right. I might just keep going. I mean, I would think Lyme disease, but I'm just saying, like, let's say anybody, right? And then stage two is disseminated, so one to four months later. So, okay, you had a weird bite a month ago, right, or two months ago, or three, you know, you're not going to connect the two necessarily, and they're flu-like symptoms. The other thing, they call this disease a great pretender because it's kind of a nightmare for physicians because migratory pain, feeling tired. Uh, and what they mean by migratory is, you know, oh, my back hurts. Wait, you know, my, my shoulders kind of hurt. My neck hurts. So it kind of moves around and it depends, joints, nerve pain, things like that. If I go in to my physician and go, yeah, I'm kind of tired and, you know, I'm kind of achy, they're going to go, yeah, you're old. Here, have some leave. Like, you know, no one's going to think, is it Lyme disease? You know, it's just not gonna come up. The thing is it can cause other things, so cardiac issues, but that's not a big ding, ding, ding. Oh, it must be Lyme disease, neurological disorders. After that, so five months to two years, late stage and chronic arthritis, they think the disease has existed before then, but remember what clued them off is a group, a large group of children. Children don't get arthritis. Like I said, I walk in there, I'm achy, you know, but kids had arthritis and they were all in the same area, which brought the epidemiologists there going, okay, what's happening here? So, yeah, migratory pains, but joints, heart, nervous system can affect those, so it's, it's difficult. It is treatable, but it has to be diagnosed, so that's the problem. 
All right, so take a little three minute break. Uh, do what you need to do. When you come back, get gloves, get your uh, lab apron, and then I have the place roughly alphabetical order. Initial, your first initial, if I could read it. 